2010, what was then the Council of Excellence Committee? We were doing exactly the same thing and it didn't, it didn't take off. So there's so much feeling here. We want to make sure that this isn't forgotten anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could I just make one Yes, we do need, we, we welcome the uh, involvement, but can we be you know, sort of economical with the times when we do it? Well, did I say, James? <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good The constituency, the constituency forum in Middle West works very well, Jerry. So if you'd like to come Very along, good. Jerry, let me finish. Okay. I, didn't, I didn't interrupt you. That you don't interrupt me. Well. And that goes for everyone else. <laughs> can you listen? I'm going to stick up for that. Cheers. Can you please <laughs> listen to me? So can you listen to me? Can you listen to me? Can Jerry, 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 order. I don't want to sound like the speaker, but be quiet. Um, Come along to our constituency forum meeting and see how it's, it's done very well, Jerry. But I think that's an excellent idea from, from Chris, one of his very few I might have.
but they're also going to be so important to the economy of the country. Uh, because as we know, we're living in a low-skilled, low-pay economy at the moment, which is, it's got to be put back. And the only way of doing that is by investing in the youth of this country, both at primary school level, secondary school level, university, um, and apprenticeships. So apprenticeships have changed over the years. They're no longer just, you did five years, you signed up for your indentures, and you started, and, and after five years, you got your indentures, and you were a fully qualified apprentice. But the important thing, and, and the thing that's come across most to me is, that these kids, and they're primarily kids, but not all these days, there are people over in the, in the mid-twenties, thirties, and even forties who are now doing the apprenticeships. But the apprenticeship model now, and it can't just be we're turning out a thousand hairdressers, and we're turning out 1,500 beauticians. And we do need hairdressers and beauticians, but we need plumbers, bricklayers, some of us need them more than others, I might add. But we need bricklayers, plumbers, um, mechanics, mechanical engineering. And what we've got to do, and we're having the schools in next and the colleges, and we've got to get this across to them, that we've got to look at apprenticeships like we do in Germany, who've got a high manufacturing economy. Our economy is based on consumerism. Not the same in Germany. It's based on manufacturing. And we've got to get back to that. But the only way we can do it and somebody said to me, I've been doing a lot of research into apprenticeships. Someone said to me, um, it's not the children you've got to be talking to, it's the children's parents. Because all these parents these days want all their children to be going to university. Mm. And I will champion university. I think there's nothing wrong with, with a bin man having a degree and so on. But we, we've got to get to the parents and the children. And we've got to tell them that there's as much kudos in an apprenticeship. And if you get to a, you get a level two, but once you get to level three, you're talking about A-level qualifications then. And if you get to a level four, you're talking about university graduates here. So we've got to convince our parents, certainly our, our pupils, but mostly I believe our parents, that we don't want the kids running off. And, in, and if we look at universities now with tuition fees, these kids are coming out with a huge, huge amounts of debt, which a lot of them will carry for their whole life. And the government have told us, well, they might not necessarily pay it back, and they might I think there's a lot of them who aren't going to ever pay it back. But then the exchequer pick it up, the taxpayer picks it up. But the fact of the matter is, these kids carry this debt all their lives, which impinges on them getting a mortgage, even borrowing money to buy a car. So we've got to get it across to, to parents particularly, that there's, it's as valued a degree and an apprenticeship should be looked on with equal measure, as it is on the continent. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing in the, in the scrutiny committee at the moment. I think it's important, I think it's important we get it right, and I think it's important that the recommendations we make to the leaders of the Liverpool city region, that we need, and this, and I, I might add that this, the levy, the two companies who came on, and the councils, we still don't know what the ground rules are from the government on, on levies. We don't know the money that they're bringing in, whether whether they can they can spend it down the line with the, uh, the people who supply them in the supply chain. We don't know if it comes into a region where it, where it can be used uh, for the greater good. So there's still a lot of ground to be made and there's still a lot of stuff that companies out there and councils are might have are still waiting for on, on the levy for the information. So that's that's where we are with it, with the Liverpool with the Liverpool City region and what we're doing at the moment. So if there's any questions from anybody, um, I'll do my best to answer them. We've got more room first, I've got your name right there, one. Thank you. Sir. Uh, I think what I, in my long life of 19 years, I've, I've had two apprenticeships, uh, one of which was positive and I've gained qualifications from that and life skills, the other of which 
I believe the government is promoting, and I genuinely believe that the government are using apprentices, and many businesses alike are using a certain type of apprenticeship as cheap labour. Um, I am not going to name the employer, um, I was an apprentice at a uh, law firm in Liverpool <coughs> around five months. Um, I left that apprenticeship on the basis that it wasn't a real apprenticeship, in the sense that I wasn't gaining real life skills and I was just used as an administrator. I do think there has to be serious scrutiny of the type of apprenticeship which the government are promoting. I do think that we have to look at and listen to apprentices who currently work, not just in the um, automotive and engineering industry, but those in the business administ in administration industry, because I do think that there's lessons to be learned from them. And I genuinely believe, and I can say that, but I genuinely believe that we need to look into the um, business administration apprenticeship. Thanks, Warren. Yes, we are looking at that. When we were going to invite people who are, who are currently doing apprenticeships along to give evidence, but we're also going to invite people along who have dropped out to ask them the reasons why they haven't completed them. Um, so we have picked up on that, but that is an important point. Well, thank you. Chris. Yes, thanks, Jen. Um, I just wanted to add that, you know, as you talked about um, not just hairdressers and beauticians, but bricklayers and plumbers, and I personally think, I want to hear what you said about the gold standard, and I think on World Council, that's what we should be aiming for, yeah. for our apprenticeships, our own gold standard, that we can learn from the moderns. But we, we, also want, we also want to uh, encourage apprenticeships in um, digital industries, filmmaking, video makers, people working in marketing, branding, event management, social entrepreneurs, uh, fashion designers, people who want to set up their own restaurants and bars and microbreweries, furniture <coughs> makers, music producers, photographers, IT professionals. That's how we've got to think. There are so many jobs out there. Now, it's not that we, the good news is we don't have to invent the wheel. This is happening. Really? It's happening in other parts of the country and in other parts of Europe and in other parts of the world. So our ambitions need to be to make make the opportunities available. And I think the point of parents is a really interesting one. Let's factor that in really in a really early stage, that the exciting jobs of the future, the, the high quality, well-paid jobs of the future, is what our apprenticeship, our, our apprenticeship strategy needs to be about. Yeah. So, thank you. Thanks for that, Chris. Thank you. Dave. Uh, thank you, Chair. I do not disagree with any comments that have just, just been made in relation to apprenticeships. Uh, but I've been to the report in front of us, and specifically um, the Appendix 2. And reading the Appendix 2, I will be moving the recommendation at the end that I'll get support and not my will. And the reason I'm doing that is because reading the report, it, it states on uh, 2 11 on page 62, calling should by, by 10 members uh, of the scrutiny panel waiting to move request. It also goes on to state that it should be. Uh, it can be overlooked by the mayor. Uh, all decisions should be uh, done while available by electronic means within two working days. I believe that's far too short. It should be at least one way to read it, not two. To give true reflection and the ability to uh, scrutinise and deal with the issues properly. And the outside of that is, as I said before, the proposed electric mayor will have the right to override that of its uh, financial or any other. The only one that I can actually pick on, which is locally, which is Manchester, Greater Manchester, who are already running it, they actually have a screen where the calling only needs five members, not ten. And I think that would be far more advantageous towards an overall matter with a conversation. Uh, welcoming opportunities for cooperation 
funding, growth and identity that the deal provides cannot endorse the government's report or scrutiny principles on the lines suggested. Whilst there are checks and balances that require unanimity between council leaders and the mayor, the majority voting is identified circumstances there is insufficient opportunity formally set out for the members of councillors to influence or shape our city region. The calling process suggested is rarely likely to be triggered for that way. The composition of the council remains similar to the current configuration. Setting up an enshrine with such a high bar, which would be 10 members for the calling instead of five, like Manchester, um, such a high bar for the calling process is undemocratic. The government's mechanism does not formally require the mayor to bring together consults involved members of the constituent authorities. This democratic defect has to be addressed. And I will move that. So if we, yeah, it, it, if you read it out and then we'll take the vote and read it out. 
Council works well with you. And I'm sorry. Please, please, listen. At least listen to what the, the, the recommendation is. Well, well, I'd, like to hear it again. I'd like to hear it again, Dave. Yes, please. please stop. This Council was welcoming opportunities for cooperation, funding, growth, and identity that the deal provides. Cannot endorse the government's report or scrutiny principles on the line suggested as we wanted. Whilst there are checks and balances that require unanimity between council leaders and the mayor, the majority, the majority voting is defined in circumstances where there is insufficient opportunity formally set out for the members of the councils to influence or shape the city region. The calling process suggested is rarely likely to be composition of the council remains similar to the current configuration. Setting up and enshrining such a high bar for the call-in process is undemocratic. The government's mechanism does not formally require the mayor to bring together, consult and involve members of the constituents or authorities. This democratic defect has to be addressed. And that's okay, okay. And that's seconded by, by Chris. Yeah. All those in favour of that of that amendment.
knows who is the host of here and there. And we don't know whether that's good value for money. Nobody's ever told us otherwise for where we are. But I do feel that's misleading for the women.
between families and well-being children and people. Well, guess there was men as 5.3 million. That clearly doesn't include the millions that were thrown in from the outset.
you're comfortable. You don't know how much you're managing you're going to write off. So we can't really scrutinize any of this. We can read it and we can get a general trend. And we can say, yes, it's gone down from last year. But we don't really know. You don't know if it's gone down from last year because you've got more in or you have less debt to begin with or whatever. None of it's clear enough for us to actually see how we go. Can I just come back on that, Jenny, please? I think what we need is, we need to know, and as the members have elucidated, we need to know what debt is historical, what debt we've got to charge over, over the property so we are going to recover it, and what debt we're going to fight off. Because there could be a, a, a lot of this. I, I was going to ask, after everybody, after all the members have finished, when, when does it come to the where we write it off, because a lot of this are, are, are debts which have been accrued by very vulnerable families, and we're never going to get it back. So, really, for us to scrutinise it, as a filmmaker point, Christina, well, all the members really have made the point, for it to be of any meaning to us so we can scrutinise it, which is what we're here for, we need that extra information. Do you, do you get what, what I'm saying? I do, it's saying. Maybe what we need is to understand how this moves. So what we just went for 10 days, the previous quarter, the first, the final, the second final, the third final, they occur at certain points when the date of death is raised. So I'm sorry, Jenny, I'm sorry, please. Well, sorry. we've got an officer here who's trying to explain a complicated situation. So I would have appreciated it if you don't make small talk. 